Hello and welcome to our next video. So we're now in the year 1679 and this is an important year. So in this video, we're just simply going to stick to this one year, 1679. Now, if you remember way back at the restoration of Charles II in 1660, a Presbyterian minister by the name of James Sharp uh, went to London as an agent for the Scottish Presbyterians. Now, James Sharp, however, um, although he was representing the, the Presbyterians in Scotland, had his own agenda. He would go on to, to betray his fellow, his fellow Presbyterians and he would work with the king to uh, restore episcopacy back to the church here in Scotland. In 1661, uh, well, they succeeded in getting episcopacy uh, back into the church in Scotland. And in 1661, James Sharp was appointed Archbishop of St Andrews. He then set about the work of suppressing the Covenanters in Scotland. In 1664, he successfully got the King to, to re-establish the Court of, of High Commission. Now, this Court of High Commission consisted of nine bishops and 35 laymen. And Sharp, he was, he was ahead of it. Now, its focus was the suppression of the Covenanters and this Court of High Commission had, had great powers. It had the power to send the military to arrest you without charge. It could fine you huge amounts of money, imprison, torture, banish and even sell you uh, as a slave to the plantations. And there was nothing, nothing you could do about it. There was no, no chance uh, of appeal. Because of this, the, uh, this ruthlessness, Sharp became one of the, the Covenanters' most hated enemies. Now, if you remember back in, in the last video, when some of the Covenanters who had been captured at the Battle of Rolling Green and had surrendered, um, they had surrendered on the promise of being given quarter. And Sharp was one of those who had said to them that yeah, they had been pardoned as soldiers, but they were not, yeah, but you are not acquitted as, as subjects. And he was also one of those who had uh, who was a leading figure in bringing down the Highland Host, which again we spoke about in the last video. On the 3rd of May 1679, Archbishop Sharp was in his carriage, travelling past a place called Magus Muir, near St Andrews, when his carriage was overtaken and stopped by a group of Covenanters. But they had actually been lying in wait uh, for, for another man. Uh, but when they saw uh, Sharp going past in his coach, they believed that, that God had put this notorious persecutor into their hands. So they chased the carriage, stopped it, and they took him out, and they told him the reasons why they were going to put him to death, um, which they did so. They, they laid out charges, and then they killed him. Now, this whole thing was unplanned. It was unpremeditated. Um, and although there was reasons behind it, we, we can't condone murder. And most of the Covenanters didn't. Sadly, Sharp's death would lead to, to much more persecution and, and a lot more deaths for many more Covenanters. Shortly afterwards, the, the government um, issued a proclamation calling the, the field meetings, the Covenanters' uh, conventicles, rendezvous of rebellion. And they said that, that anyone attending these rendezvous of rebellion were guilty of treason. On the 29th of May 1679, Around 80 armed Covenanters, led by Robert, uh, Robert Hamilton of Preston, rode into uh, the, the town of Rutherglen, which is now really south, well, south of Glasgow, but it's been incorporated into the city. And when they were into Rutherglen, they extinguished the bonfires, which had been ordered to be lit to celebrate the, the restoration of Charles II as king. They read out their declaration, and in it, they spoke out against all the acts of the government since the Reformation. They publicly burnt the acts that was directed against the Reformation and they fixed their declaration to the town cross uh, there in Rutherglen. Afterwards, they, they rode off out into the moors. On the 1st of June 1679, the Covenanters had gathered together for an open-air worship service near Loudon Hill and in, in, now in East Ayrshire. Someone tipped off the authorities about the service and Claverhouse and his dragoons came to, to disrupt it. By this day, the Covenanters had come armed 
and they were ready to to defend themselves. A lot of the, the, the weapons they had were just simply farm implements, but they were ready to defend themselves. So, on hearing the warning shot from one of the lookouts that had been posted to guard the congregation, uh, they posted uh, lookouts all round about. The Reverend Thomas Douglas, who was the one who had been preaching, and he'd been preaching on a sermon on suffering for Christ. And he'd almost concluded the sermon when the warning shot, warning shot went off, and he turned to the worshippers and he said, Well, you've got the theory, now for the practice. And with that, the Covenanters sent the, the women and the children away to the top of the hill um, behind them, whilst the men set themselves up in a defensive position on the opposite side of some boggy ground, um, which is just down the hill a little bit from where the, the monument to the battle stands today. Claverhouse approached. He told the, the, the Covenanters to lay down their arms and, and hand over the ministers, which they didn't do. They, they, they refused to do that. And instead, they actually sang Psalm 76 to the tune Martyrs. Um, the arrows of the bow he breaks. And this really infuriated Claverhouse, who ordered these men to attack. But the move behind the bog gave the Covenanters an advantage. Um, because when Claverhouse's men charged down to attack the horses, they were slowed down when, when they went into the, the boggy area. And it was really this that allowed the Covenanters to, to get the upper hand um, and, and uh, uh, attack the troops. Claverhouse saw that his men were, were, were losing after being attacked and he decided to sound a retreat. Um, and the, the, the soldiers fled, leaving more than 30 dragoons dead on the field. Uh, Covenanter losses were, were, were just in single figures. Claverhouse himself had, had a narrow escape. His horse was, was um, um, killed from under him, but uh, he managed to get on another one and escape. Now, immediately following this defeat at Drumclog, Graham of Claverhouse and his men retreated all the way back to Glasgow, where they hoped uh, for support from the people of Glasgow. But the people of, that, of Glasgow made it quite clear that, that they were just not welcome. Now, knowing that the Covenanters were pursuing him, Claverhouse then had his troops build barricades around the town cross, um, which is at the bottom of the high street. And the next morning, after Drumclog, the 2nd of June, 1679, the Covenanters, uh, uh, under the command of Robert Hamilton, came along the Gallowgate, which is a street leading into Glasgow. Um, and as they approached uh, to, towards the, the town cross, the, the Covenanters came under fire from, from the barricades. And they also came under fire from, from snipers, which were hidden in, in the houses nearby um, and some of the closes. And at that point, a number of Covenanters were killed um, uh, from the sniper fire and from the, the barricades. Uh, but a skirmish ensued. Uh, but the Covenanters just couldn't get past the barricades. They tried to lure the troops out, which they did, but... Um, the troops just went back when the Covenanters turned. So they couldn't get into Glasgow, so they turned and left. Now, for their apparent support of the Covenanters um, and for refusing to help uh, to help them, Claverhouse sought permission from the Duke of Monmouth to, to burn Glasgow to the ground. Uh, but thankfully, he, he was refused. But he did, however, um, allow his men to, to, to pillage the town, which they did. Now, after failing to, to, to take Glasgow, the Covenanters marched towards Hamilton. Um, and as they were marching there, the, the, their numbers were increasing all the time. Hundreds were joining them every day. Uh, by the time that they had gathered at the field um, outside Hamilton, just next to, to Bothwell Bridge, which was one of the main crossings over the River Clyde at that time, by the time they had camped there um, on the 22nd of June 1679, they numbered approximately three to four thousand men. Sadly, however, they had two very serious flaws. Firstly, th their leadership was weak and there was a lot of disunity uh, within that, that leadership about the plan. Secondly, the people themselves um, were just mostly country people, farmers, uh, weavers, shepherds. They were not soldiers um, and they were very poorly armed. Now, all the while they're there, the Duke of Monmouth is approaching with about 15,000 professional troops, uh, including a band of these Highlanders as well. And on the morning of the 22nd of June 1679, a group of Covenanters crossed the River Clyde to meet Monmouth. They found them to be 
to be lenient, but uh, he refused to, to treat with them unless they laid down their arms within half an hour. All the while, on the other side of the, the, the river, uh, the Covenanters are, are still in a, a state of disruption and dispute, arguing amongst themselves and um, very little discipline. But they decided to fight. A man by the name of David Haxton um, and 300 uh, Covenanters held Bothwell Bridge. They held the bridge for as long as they could, but they were eventually overpowered. Uh, by the time the rest of the Covenanters had gathered themselves together for the, for the fight, it, it was too late. Some of their own horses uh, at the end of their line got spooked and actually charged into the, to their own lines. And this just caused chaos and, and confusion amongst the Covenanter ranks. Um, approximately 400 Covenanters, although there is some reports that, that, that you can read um, that, that say there were probably a lot more, uh, approximately a thousand, that were cut down in what became known as, as the Death Chase. Now, had it not been for the order of, of Monmouth himself, who, had, as we had said earlier, he'd, um, was, was lenient towards them, hundreds more of the Covenanters would have been run through uh, with swords. But as it was, um, 1,200 prisoners uh, were taken and they were made to strip and lie down in the field. They were told that if they, if they lifted their heads, uh, they, would have been, they would have been killed uh, by sword. It would be later on that, that Monmouth would actually be severely reprimanded for, for the mercy that he'd shown to the, to the Covenant of prisons, uh, prisoners at Bothwell Bridge. But anyway, they were taken, the prisoners were taken, led off to Edinburgh. And as they reached the city, there was a jeering mob just waiting for them. And they were taunting them and they were shouting at them and mocking them and shouting things like, where's your God? Where's your God? Um, the prisoners were then taken to a walled off section of, of Greyfriars Kirkyard and they were, they were locked up behind there. Um, it's now known as the Covenanter Prison. For those that refused the bond that was offered to them um, and were released, the next five months were horrendous for, horrendous for those who, who remained inside the, the Covenanter Prison. Many died of starvation and disease. Five of them that had nothing to do with Archbishop James Sharp's death were taken uh, from Edinburgh uh, from the prison there and marched to Magus Muir where they were hanged in chains as revenge for the Archbishop's death. By November, five months later, there were 257 left from the original 1200 and they were to be sold as slaves uh, to Barbados. But as the ship was passing Orkney, it got caught in a storm. The captain ordered abandon ship, but he told the crew, before you get off, nail down the hatches. Um, we don't want the cargo escaping, the cargo being the Covenanters. Uh, over 200 Covenanters drowned on the shipwreck. Those that did make it off, um, the sailors were throwing them into the sea. As 1679 came to a close, it looked like the Covenanters were finally defeated and finished. But God was already at work in the Scottish church. Because uh, in the church in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, there was a, a Scottish church there. A former school teacher from Lookers by the name of Richard Cameron was ordained as a minister. He would become known as the Lion of the Covenant. And his followers would become known as, as Cameronians. Richard Cameron would shortly return back to Scotland and alongside men like the Reverend Donald Cargill, um, the Reverend Sandy Peden, Alexander Peden, James Rennick and, and many others, um, he would be used, they would be used to gather together the faithful, uh, faithful remnant of God's people in Scotland and just to continue the struggle for uh, religious freedom. It would be plain. It wouldn't be. Uh, it wouldn't be plain sailing. However, the, the period in which these men of God operated would become known as the Killing Times, and for good reason. And that's where we're going to pick it up the next time, um, from 1680 up to till 1688. So thanks again, and we'll bring the next one to you again shortly. Take care. Bye.